Shalom, I'm Pastor Scott Delane with Holy Impact Ministries. And I just wanted to take a moment to say Happy Fourth of July to everyone here in the States who is observing the Fourth of July this year. The Fourth of July is traditionally known as the day that the United States celebrated its Declaration of Independence. And I know that it's usually a day of barbecues and fireworks and family and fun. But I'd also submit to you that it is during these types of celebrations that people are oftentimes more willing to give their weapons rest and to allow the walls of animosity to come down. Because it is oftentimes this celebration that includes family and friends and neighbors and those in our communities, that this can be an opportunity to heal wounds. It can be an opportunity to look at each other in a different light. It can be an opportunity to realize that we are all created in the image of God. The Declaration of Independence is indeed an important document and this celebration should indeed be recognized for what it is. But I would also contend that this celebration should also be celebrated in honor of the one who has blessed this nation for the last 245 years. The Elohim of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has blessed these great United States for the past 245 years and for 245 years the hand of Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, has been upon this land and this nation and its diversity of people. This nation has been blessed abundantly above and beyond any other nation on the face of the earth. And although there will always be those who believe that the United States was not founded as a Christian nation, I think that those of us who do our homework certainly do know better. Today there are those who are attempting to remove the title of Christian from this nation. There are those who will scoff at the mention of the United States being founded as a Christian nation. But once again, this does not change the historical facts that are currently found all throughout of our history books. And so I'd like to challenge you this very day to do your homework. I'd like to challenge you to mark this day as a day that you would begin to study your history, to know and to understand what the Declaration of Independence is and who wrote it and why is important to remember in these last days. I would even go so far as to submit to you that it is impossible for anyone to truly understand the Declaration of Independence if they can't truly first understand and identify the definition of a Christian. Consider the Mayflower Compact. Consider what people were running from when they first came to this land. And please also consider that God or the Divine is mentioned at least once in one of the 50 different constitutions that make up the United States. Nearly 200 different times God is mentioned within these individual state constitutions. In fact, more than one state mentions God more than 10 times within their constitutions. This, my friends, is important to remember. Over this weekend, as the barbecues are being fired up and fireworks are being lit, my hope and my prayer is that we can look at each other and recognize each other as human beings. No matter what our belief, no matter what we stand for, no matter which political party that we hail from, my hope and my prayer is that we will all realize that we all come from the same place. And because we have all come from the same place, we all have been given the same opportunity. An opportunity to sign a new Declaration of Independence a new declaration of freedom that frees us from the bondage of sin and the bondage of this world. For those of us who are true God-fearing, Messiah-following, cross-bearing Christians, 
this weekend can be a great opportunity to simply enjoy the company of those who are our neighbors and part of our communities. My hope and my prayer is that the world will see the light that is in us this weekend and that our good works would precede even our faith. Remember, it is oftentimes because of our good works that do precede our faith that people are oftentimes led to ask us about our faith. Reach out this weekend and offer an olive branch to those who you might not otherwise speak to. Offer a smile to someone that you may consider your enemy. Speak a kind word to someone whose lifestyle you might disagree with. Let them know how great your God is and the love that he has for us all. It is indeed important to speak the truth boldly. But before we can speak the truth boldly, we need to gain the trust of those who we're speaking to. We need to show them the love and the peace and the joy that resides within us. We need to make them jealous of what we have before they will trust us enough to believe what it is that we're telling them. My hope and my prayer is that maybe, just maybe, one of us might gain the trust of someone who is lost. Maybe. Just maybe one of us might be able to cover a multitude of sins. Maybe, just maybe, the kingdom of our soon coming Messiah might be expanded this very weekend and a new declaration of independence from the bondage of sin might be signed by at least one more prodigal son or daughter. That's my hope and my prayer for this 4th of July weekend. But before I let you go, I'd like to simply remind everyone that during this festive event, we should always remember that in the end, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is indeed the whole duty of man. Just something to keep in mind this festive weekend. Happy Fourth of July, everyone, and shalom to all of our brothers and sisters, past, present, and future. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. God bless you, and thank you so very much for joining us this morning on this particular weekend. What a blessing it is to be with you, and uh, you got a chance to see uh, Pastor V as you would probably see him walking down the street uh, in the uh, in the old uh, John Deere hat and uh, uh, ready to go. Uh, so uh, I hope that you enjoyed that, and uh, once again, happy 4th of July to everybody this weekend. Uh, it is, again, 4th of July weekend of 2022 at the time of this particular broadcast. With that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump immediately right into our study uh, this morning because we've got a lot to cover. And uh, we don't want to go too far. Again, I don't want to do this in large chunks because I want people to uh, be able to sit here in one setting and actually hear this. So uh, again, we're going to be talking by and large today about the abomination of desolation. And so, again, we are in the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew, and last week during our study into the 24th uh, chapter, we talked about some uh, of the things that our Messiah prophesied about concerning the time of his return to the earth. And we spoke in some detail about the very first thing that our Messiah said when his disciples asked him what should be the sign of his coming and his second coming. And once again, the very first thing that our Messiah says is to see to it that no one leads us astray, upon which time he continued to say that many would come in his name, saying that they were the Christ, the Messiah, and that these false Christ, these false messiahs, would lead many people astray. As of today, there have been 266 Roman Catholic popes who all proclaim themselves to be the vicar of or the replacement of the Christ, our Messiah. And to say that these men have led many people astray would simply be an understatement. 
The practices of paganism within Roman Catholicism and its many festivals and traditions runs much, much deeper than even that of the Pharisees and the scribes of our Messiah's time, who are Messiah called children of the devil, amongst other things. And we also spoke about many other stunning similarities that are taking place today in our time. Our Messiah gave us somewhat of a laundry list of things that would take place right before the coming of his second return. Not only did he prophesy about Roman Catholicism and the beast that it is and her popery, but he also prophesied that we would hear of wars and rumors of wars and that nation would rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He also prophesied that we would have famines and earthquakes in various places. But he said that all of these things were simply going to be the beginning of birth pain. Our Messiah continues on in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, and he warns us that they will deliver us up to, to tribulation and put us to death, and that we will be hated by all nations for his name's sake. And I would submit to you that this has been going on all throughout history. From the day that he spoke these very words in places like China and North Korea and several other third world countries and nations who literally hate Christianity and the free gift of salvation that our Father in heaven has freely extended to us. Just a few years ago, we saw Christians being beheaded on national television by ISIS simply because of their faith. And I tell you the truth. Many more atrocities like these have continued on even to this very day. And what's even more alarming is that even today in our time, there are those within the great United States who are attempting to wipe Christianity from this nation. And we could do a whole study on this, but we'll save that for our The Truth of Prophecy program, which we are working on as we speak. But once again, Our Messiah continues on to tell us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, that the one who endures to the end will be saved. And I would submit to you that this statement that our Messiah made in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, is a statement that many churches today in our time absolutely hate and despise. Many have tried to remove Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 from our Bibles through their denominational dogmas and theologies and philosophical understanding. But once again, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 still remains, and it always will. He who endures to the end will be saved. Many of our modern-day so-called Christian denominational empires will teach anything and everything other than the one who endures to the end will be saved. You see, they don't like that scripture. It doesn't set well with them. It doesn't fill their coffers and it doesn't scratch the itching ears of their congregants. But the truth of the matter is that Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 remains in our Bibles. And no matter how hard we try to erase Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 from the Bible, the truth will always remain the truth, and no church dogma, theology, or philosophical belief system is going to erase the truth of our God-breathed Scripture. And then we get down to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, where our Messiah quotes from the prophet Daniel concerning the abomination of desolation. And he tells his disciples that when they see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, that they are to flee to the mountain. He tells them that the one who is on the housetop should not go back into the house, but to run. He tells the one who's in the field not to go back and take his cloak. And as for women who are pregnant in those days, he tells them to pray that their flight might not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath, for there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now and never will be again. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would even be alive. But for the sake of the uh, the elect, those days will be cut short. And so, the abomination of desolation is a road marker, if you will, according to our Messiah. The abomination of desolation is a sign that we should be looking for, according to our Messiah. Keeping all of this in mind, there are all kinds of different teachings and assumptions and speculations and assertions floating around on the internet right now concerning the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. 
But I would submit to you that the abomination of desolation can only be properly understood by those who take the time to sit down and to pray and to read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament for themselves. Some believe that they already know the identity of the abomination of desolation. Others believe that the abomination of desolation was fulfilled during the days of Antiochus Epiphany, who interrupted the temple services between 168 and 165 BC. And of course, the abomination that they point to is the pig that Antiochus Epiphanes had offered up on the altar of the temple of God uh, during these particular days. Others believe that the abomination of desolation is going to take place in the future. And yet there are still others who believe that the abomination of desolation has to do with the Roman standards which were worshipped in Jerusalem in 70 AD at the time of the destruction of the temple by Roman general Titus. And so you see, there are all kinds of different ideas, all kinds of different beliefs, and all kinds of different theories concerning the abomination of desolation. And I would submit to you that therein lies the problem. Just as in, with, in Christianity itself, there are all kinds of different theologies and dogmas and belief systems, so too are there many different denominational theories and dogmas and belief systems when it comes to the abomination of desolation. But according to our Messiah, he says that we would be looking for the abomination of desolation written of by the prophet Daniel. And therefore, if we really want to understand what the abomination of desolation is, we need to open the book of Daniel and to begin to study by asking, seeking, and knocking on the door of our Messiah, who told us that the key to understanding these things is found in the book of Daniel. And when we open the book of Daniel, and when we truly study it, we find that Daniel actually prophesied about three different abominations of desolations. Daniel did not simply prophesy about one abomination of desolation. And therefore, if we understand all three of these abominations of desolations that the prophet Daniel prophesied about, we should be able to know and understand not only what has already happened in the past, but what is about to happen in the future. The Bible always gives us shadow pictures of things to come. If you've been with us throughout our study into the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, you're already aware of what we call the reality of duality. You're already familiar with the concept of shadow pictures, if you will, events that show us beforehand what is about to come, events that show us shadow pictures of things to come. It could be argued that Joseph was a shadow picture of our Messiah. Joseph was loved by his father. Joseph was hated by his brothers. Joseph was cut off from his people. And we can go down a long laundry list of things that show us how Joseph, the son of Isaac, whose name was changed to Israel, was seen as a shadow picture of our Messiah. You could also say that Moses was a shadow picture of our Messiah. It was written in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that God would send the house of Israel a prophet likened unto Moses who was the mediator between God and man at that time. Both Moses and our Messiah were mediators between God and man. Both Moses and our Messiah were raised up from among the brothers of the house of Israel. Both were shepherds. Both brought salvation to the house of Israel. Both fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Both spent time in Egypt as children. Both were born at a time when evil kings pronounced death to all Jewish male children in the area. Both were called by God to lead and to save. Both did miracles to testify the, uh, of their God-given authority. And we could go on and on and on and on. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that our Father in Heaven always gives us a shadow picture of things that are to come. He always gives us a warning. He always shows us what is going to happen before it happens. And we must always remember that it is written that He does nothing without first letting His prophets know. And you can read that in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, for those of you who don't know where that is. And therefore, as we read down through the book of Daniel, we can see that there are shadow pictures of the abomination of desolation that have already taken place before our very eyes, at least for those of us who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. 
And these shadow pictures can help us to understand what's yet to come if we know where to find them and how to properly interpret them. To simplify these things very quickly, the first abomination of desolation took place involving the first temple, when the Babylonian Empire had destroyed the temple and had taken the tribe of Judah, the southern kingdom, into captivity. The second abomination of desolation took place in 70 AD, just as our Messiah had prophesied that it would by the Roman Empire. And the third and final abomination of desolation is still yet to come some time in the future, according to the prophet Daniel. And these things are fairly easy to see when one sits down and reads the book of Daniel for themselves. I'd like us to listen closely to what is written in the first two verses of the book of Daniel. Let's go over and take a look at those first two verses in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Daniel says this, He says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. The very reason that Daniel begins with this event is because this particular event gives the reader a concise historical background concerning what Daniel is about to prophesy about in the book of Daniel concerning the abomination of desolation. What's important for us to understand is why this first abomination of desolation had taken place. And we can find that in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 5 through 7. And again, I'd like to take a look at that very quickly. Let's take a look at that. Hold on here just a second here. I think that we need to go back here and get a different PDF here. Let me do that very quickly here. I think I'm jumping the, uh, jumping the proverbial gun here. Let me go back here and get this particular PDF file here. This is the one that I want. All right, and let's try this again. And we will go to PowerPoint. Here we go. Again, here we go. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 5 through 7 says this. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of Yahovah his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried part of the vessels of the house of Yahovah to Babylon and put them in his palace in Babylon. And so, clearly, the reason for the first abomination of desolation of the temple was because Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, was evil in the sight of Yahovah his God. Yahovah allowed the abomination of desolation to take Babylon to, uh, into uh, uh, Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And it was once again because of the disobedience of the southern kingdom of Judah that the abomination of desolation was allowed to take place. It was because of the disobedience of the southern kingdom that Yahuwah God had removed his hand of safety from them. What was the abomination? Well, we're going to talk about what that abomination was that caused the desolation of the temple. The southern kingdom of Judah had followed after their king Jehoiakim and his son Jehoiakim, who was no better than his father was. This judgment of Yahovah God took place by the spilling of the blood of his people and the complete destruction of both the city and the sanctuary. And once again, this had all been prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah before it ever took place. But what's even more important to understand is one of the main reasons why the southern kingdom had suffered this abomination of desolation. Why did Yahuwah God allow this particular abomination of desolation to take place specifically? We can find that in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 19 through 27. So let's go over here very quickly and let's read that for ourselves. Again, Jeremiah chapter 17 verse tw- through Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 19 through 27 says this Thus says Yahovah to me Go and stand at the people's gate by which the kings the king of Judah 
entered, and by which they go out, and all the gates of Jerusalem, and say, Hear the word of Yahovah, you kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter by these gates. Thus says Yahovah, Take care for the sake of your lives, and do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day, or bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. And do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath, or do any work. But keep the Sabbath day holy, as I commanded your fathers. Yet they did not listen or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, that they might not hear and receive instruction. But if you listen to me, declares Jehovah, and bring in no burden by the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but keep the Sabbath day holy and do no work on it, then there shall then there shall enter by the gates of this city kings and princes who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their officers and their officials, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall be inhabited forever. And people shall come from the cities of Judah and the places around Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin and from Shephaliah and from the hill country and from the Negeb, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and frankincense, and bringing thank offerings to the house of Yahovah. But, but, if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy, and do not bear a burden and enter by the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and shall not be quenched. Once again, it's important to understand that the very reason that Yahovah gives for the first abomination of desolation of Babylon is because the house of Israel had forsaken the seventh day Sabbath. Once again, listen closely to what is written in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 20 and 21. And I want to go take a look at those uh, again. Very, very important to understand this. Again, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 20 and 21 says, he took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of Yahovah by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that they lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill seventy years. And so once again, we have all been commanded to remember the Sabbath day. It is the fourth commandment within the testimony of Yahovah God that the church calls the Ten Commandments. And it is on the seventh day of the week, my friends, and not on the first day of the week. And this is also very important for us to understand. Roman Catholicism has completely removed the fourth commandment from the Ten Commandments and the testimony of Yahovah and has created her own Ten Commandments, which once again points to Roman Catholicism as a fake and a fraudulent religion. And we could say much, much more about this and the hatred of the Bible by Roman Catholicism. But for time's sake, we need to continue on in our study into the abomination of desolation. If you'd like to know more, I would encourage you to view our video documentary entitled Revelation Secret Key that can be found at our website at holyimpactministries.com. The point is that the southern kingdom of Judah suffered an abomination of desolation. What was the abomination? The abomination was not keeping the Sabbath. And what did that abomination cause? Desolation. Because of its rejection of the seventh day, Sabbath of Yahovah our Elohim. And so once again, we see the importance of remembering the seventh-day Sabbath of Yahovah. And I would like to repeat once again that the seventh-day Sabbath of Yahovah God is not on the first day of the week, Sunday Sabbath, that Roman Catholicism has invented for herself in honor of her fraudulent hope. Again, very important to know, very important to understand. Nobody anywhere in your Bible within the confines of the 66 books of your Bible ever commanded anyone keep holy the first day of the week. 
So here in Ezekiel chapter 8, we see the abomination of desolation taking place in the southern kingdom. An angel of Yahuwah appears to Ezekiel, and, and, and the angel shows Ezekiel this image of jealousy that is standing in the entrance of the gateway to the inner court. And the angel tells Ezekiel, but you will see even greater abominations than these. And the angel then takes Ezekiel down to the basement of the temple where he finds all of these pagan images engraved on the walls of uh, inside the basement of the temple. And he, the angel tells Ezekiel, you will see even greater abominations than these. And the angel takes Ezekiel to the entrance of the north gate of the temple where they see women weeping for the pagan god Tammuz. And the angel tells Ezekiel, you will see even greater abominations than these. And the angel takes Ezekiel to the inner court of the temple and at the entrance of the temple of Yahuwah between the porch and the altar. There were twenty-five men with their backs to the temple of Yahuwah God and their faces towards the east worshiping the sun. And again, Tammuz was a pagan sun god. And it is again the birthday of Tammuz on the 25th of December that is celebrated as Christ Mass and was once again invented by Roman Catholicism, who is once again the Devil's Church. You see why Easter Sunday morning sunrise services are so popular within today's Protestant denominational churches. Today's Protestant churches who no longer protest against anything, have indeed become the daughters of their mother, Church of Rome, dragging into the church these abominations. But I digress for a moment. We must remember why it was that the temple in of itself was constructed with the Ark of the Covenant to be placed at the western end of the tabernacle so that the children of Israel would face the west with their backs to the rising sun when they worshipped the Elohim of Israel. Once again, pagan traditions of men had prevailed even within the house of Yahovah, creating the abomination that would cause the desolation to come. All that was left was the desolation that Yahovah had promised, and that finally came when Babylon uh, the Babylonian desolation took the temple and, uh, and took the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity for 70 years to make up for the 70 years that they had forsaken Yahovah God's seventh day Sabbath. And I would sub submit to you that this is exactly why the seventh day Sabbath is as important as it is. If the house of Israel would have been keeping the seventh day Sabbath in remembrance, they would not have been so easily caught up in these pagan traditions. The very reason that they were caught up in these pagan traditions was because they had forgotten the seventh day Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, the weekly remembrance of who the creator of the heavens and the earth is that would have kept their minds on Jehovah God instead of on the traditions of Roman Catholicism. And yes, my friends, what we're seeing here in Ezekiel chapter 8 is indeed part and parcel of Roman Catholic faith and the Roman Catholic tradition and religion. Make no mistake about it. The religion of Roman Catholicism was built upon the pagan teachings and traditions found right here in the book of Ezekiel. In the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel prays for his people, and he admits all these abominations have taken place and he begs Jehovah God in his prayer to forgive his people and to have mercy upon them, which leads us to the second temple, which was also left desolate. As you can imagine, once the people of Israel were allowed to rebuild the second temple, the seventh-day Sabbath had become extremely important to them because they had realized that it was largely because of their rejection of this seventh-day Sabbath that the first temple had suffered an abomination of desolation. And so the seventh day Sabbath becomes extremely important during the construction of the second temple. And because of this zeal for the seventh day Sabbath, hundreds of new commandments were created by the Babylonian rabbis who had come up out of Babylon in order to gain authority and jurisdiction over Yahovah God's people concerning the seventh day Sabbath. And ultimately, because they had added to God's word, 
and had once again taken away from God's word by making all of these other commandments that he did not speak, these other commandments of the Babylonian rabbis had led the people full circle right back into disobedience. And again, all of this is in our history books. All of this is in our Bible. We need to know and we need to understand all of these things because they are very, very, very important. And this is exactly why our Messiah told the rabbinical Pharisees of his time that Isaiah had prophesied well about them when he said, They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me. Why? Because they are teaching the doctrines, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. These were once again abominations against the Elohim of Israel. Whenever we teach the doctrines and the commandments of men over the doctrines and the commandments of God our Father, we are creating for ourselves an abomination that will lead to desolation. And this is exactly why our Messiah called the Babylonian rabbinical Pharisees of his time children of the devil. It was because of these abominations that the second temple would also become desolate. And again, we've already spoken about the fact that the high priest, who is at that time calling himself a high priest in the temple, was no high priest at all because he was not in the bloodline of Aaron. He was a fake. He was a fraud. He was an what? Abomination. Listen closely to what our Messiah says in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 38. And again, this is also a very important scripture, red letter words from our Messiah. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 through 38, our Messiah warns the Pharisees. What does he say? He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. This prophecy was once again fulfilled in 70 AD, when the Romans once again made desolate the second temple because of the abominations of the house of Israel that they had in, invited into Jehovah God's house. And we must also remember that both of these abominations of both of these temples, both of the desolations of both temples, the destruction of both temples, were done by and created by the apostate people of Jehovah God. And the desolation of both of these temples took place by the hand of pagan Gentile armies that God had turned the house of Israel over to. They didn't want to serve him. They wanted to serve pagan Gentiles. So Jehovah allowed the godless Gentile heathens to have their way with them. Why was the second temple in 70 AD destroyed? Think about that for just a moment. Why was the second temple destroyed in 70 AD? Listen to what the, Daniel pro the, the, the prophet Daniel prophesied in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. Again, important for us, important scripture for us to put together here. Whoops, I'm sorry, I want to go over here to Eastward for that one. Let me go over here with Daniel, chapter 9, and I just want to read here 25 through 27. It says, Know therefore, Daniel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then 46, uh, for 62, then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and the offering. On the wing of abominations... On the wing of abominations shall, shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. 
Daniel had prophesied long before the arrival of our prince, who is our Messiah, that he would be cut off and have nothing in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. And Daniel also prophesied that the people of the prince who is still yet to come, this is a second prince, the prince yet to come, those people of that prince would indeed destroy the city and the sanctuary and exactly how the second abomination of desolation would take place. And just as Daniel prophesied here in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, the abomination of desolation of the second temple did indeed take place in 70 AD. And so the angel Gabriel, who came to Daniel in these visions, was showing Daniel that the abomination of desolation that had taken place during Babylon, which was the time that Daniel was living in, was going to repeat itself again in the future. And both times during the destruction of the sanctuary and the city, in both 586 BC and again in 70 AD by Nebuchadnezzar and then by Titus, these abominations of desolations had taken place because of the apostate people of Jehovah God, the wicked, the lawless. And this is exactly why our Messiah tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, that in the last days the love of many will grow cold because, once again, lawlessness will be increased. And when lawlessness is increased, so also are the abominations of God increased. Listen closely to what our Messiah told the rabbinical Pharisees that had come up from Babylon in Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 and 43. Again, very important scripture for us to see. What did he tell the, uh, the Pharisees uh, and uh, the, uh, the scribes? Again, Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 through 43 says this, And Yeshua said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. So here we have our Messiah telling the Pharisees, right, that the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from them and it's going to be given to another people who are producing its fruit. And exactly. Who was it that Yahuwah gave the kingdom of God to that would produce its fruit? Well, we can find that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. Let's go take a look at that. And again, I want to jump over here to Eastward for that one. And again, I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. It says this, So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word. What word? The law, the commandment of God, the spoken word of God. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These are the people he's giving the, the kingdom of God to. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak e against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Notice what Peter says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Peter says, and I quote, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And so who, has, uh, who was Peter talking to here that would become a royal priesthood and a holy nation and a people for God's own possession? He was talking to both Jew and Gentile both the sojourner, who would have been the traveler, the Gentile traveler, and the exiles, who would have been the Jews who were cut out of the olive tree. Both were being called back to reestablish the covenant of Abraham and to be heirs according to the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this had been God's plan from the very beginning, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11. And if you've never read Romans chapter 11, I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and do that. 
it would be this people made up of both Jew and Gentile that would agree to turn back like the prodigal son and to return home to the father that Yahuwah God would give his kingdom to. This is why our Messiah told the Babylonian rabbinical Pharisees that the kingdom of God would be taken away from them and given to a people producing its fruit. A people who would have the law of God written across their hearts and minds. A people who would understand that faith without works is dead. A people who would no longer bring abominations into the house of God that would require God to make that house desolate. Which brings us to the final abomination of desolation. Without getting into a complete study of the book of Daniel, it's very difficult to teach the third and the final abomination of desolation that is still yet to come. And we will very soon be opening a brand new study on the book of Daniel in our The Truth of Prophecy program. But for, for time's sake, I will simply say this. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13, and chapter 11, verse 31, and chapter 12, verse 11, all have to do with the third and final abomination of desolation that is yet to come. And I want us to know and understand that it has been Roman Catholicism that has once again brought these pagan abominations into the house of Yahuwah God that will bring the wrath of God upon not only the world, but also upon the church. It was indeed Roman Catholicism that has drug into the house of God a plethora of abominations including, but not limited to, statutes and candles and rosary beads and Easter sunrise services and Sunday Sabbath worship and transubstantation and demonstrance and Christ Mass and a whole host of abominations, including, but not limited to, the first day of the week, Sunday Sabbath, commanded by nowhere in the Bible, that are taught by Roman Catholicism. These are abominations that have been drug in to God's church, but are also now being taught by her daughter Protestant churches, who no longer protest against anything. Today's modern-day Protestant churches have indeed made themselves friends of the world and thereby enemies of God, and the abominations that they have drug into the house of God will indeed lead to the desolation of the church at his second coming. And so we have that to look forward as well. So there will be another abomination of desolation. It is still yet to come. My friends, if you know nothing else, know this. Today in our time, we are now living in the time of the church's final apostasy that have thrown the law, the word of God, to the ground. All of us right now are indeed in the midst of fulfilling this last and final prophecy of the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel because of the abominations that have been drug into the church today in our time. The abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel is still yet to come, and it will indeed cause a great time of trouble, a time of trouble that has never been seen before on the face of the earth and the time of trouble that will never be seen again. And just like when we take prayer out of our school and the devil moves in and we begin to have school shootings and death and mayhem, the same thing happens when we take God out of the church. The devil moves in and we have abomination which leads to desolation. And the devil will ultimately take his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, just as the Pope of Rome does this very day. He is anti-Christ. And yes, we will be here for this time of trouble. We are called to endure. We are called to conquer. Our Messiah pulled no punches when he told us that if the world hated him, they would also hate us also. Our Messiah pulled no punches when he told us that they would kill us thinking that they were doing God's service. Our Messiah pulled no punches when he told us that the devil would indeed throw some of us into prison, and that we would indeed be tested, and that we would indeed have tribulation, and that we would indeed need to endure even to the end, even unto death. Our Messiah pulled no punches when he told us very clearly that we would need to be faithful even unto death in order to obtain the crown of life. 
Those who deny his name before men, he will deny before his father. It is written that a servant is not greater than his master. And for those who believe in a once saved, always saved doctrine of demons and a pre-tribulation rescue from the persecution to come, know this. You can kick your pulpit, you can rent your clothes, you can throw yourself down on the floor like a spoiled, rotten child at the local Walmart, but what you cannot do, what you cannot do is to change one crossing of a T or one dotting of an I of these God-breathed scriptures. Many have already suffered, being burned alive, being beheaded, having their children torn away from them and tortured, raped, beaten, scourged, and yes, even murdered for the namesake of Yeshua HaMashiach. And I tell you the truth, these things will come upon many more before the end finally comes. It is written, Fear not what man can do to the body, but what God can do to both body and soul by casting them into the pit. Our souls are indeed protected. Who we are, our very spirits that dwell within our sinful fleshly bodies, are indeed protected. But think not that these sinful bodies will inherit the kingdom of God. They will not. And for those of you who think that the wrath of God has not already begun, let me ask you this. When God pulls his protective hand away from a nation, does he pull his protective hand away from that nation because he's happy with that nation? When God pulls his protective hand away from a nation, I would submit to you that God is angry. That is a sign of his wrath. He is not happy. God does not pull his protective hand away from a nation that he is happy with. Why are we suffering plagues today? Why is a famine on the horizon? Why is financial collapse imminent? Why is the earth heating up? Why is our society changing? Why are there so many earthquakes and sinkholes and signs in the sun and the moon and stars? Why is there so much sexual immorality in the world today and in our societies and in our culture? Have you read the book of Revelation? Do you know what the four horsemen bring? Do you know what has been prophesied? I suppose that we should all think that all of these things are happening because God is happy. I suppose that the wrath of God is not yet begun yet, according to your man-made denominational dogma. But I tell you the truth. We'd better think again. Because our Father in heaven is not and I repeat, not happy. I tell you the truth, because so many will not. Prepare. Prepare your children. Prepare your communities. Prepare by renewing your mind daily and putting on the full armor of God. For a time that you have never seen is indeed on the horizon and is approaching quickly. And remember that it is written, Fear not what man can do to the body, but what God can do to both body and soul by casting them into the pit. Stand strong. Endure to the end. Conquer over evil that is yet to come. And we will have the victory. Shrink back in the face of adversity, and our Messiah will find no pleasure in us. It's not about being once saved, always saved, and looking for a pre-tribulation rescue. It's about whether or not we truly love him as much as he loved us. A servant is not greater than his master. These are things that we need to prepare for, remember, and have solidified down to our boots. And with that, my friends, we will once again close the books for this morning and we'll continue this teaching next Seventh day Sabbath at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And until then, I will once again ask everyone within the sound of my voice to please take what you've heard here today to your own prayer closet. Bow your head and bend your knee and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you have heard here today be true or not. Ask, seek, and knock on his door and on his door alone so that the proper door can be opened to you. And if you will do that, and if you will stay the course to the end, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon coming kingdom together.
Once again, everybody, I just want to say thank you so very much for allowing me to go through these things with you and to help enlighten you and encourage you to go back and read the book of Daniel. Uh, we are going to be studying the book of Daniel, and uh, our The Truth of Prophecy program was created for that, to talk about things that are happening uh, in these last days and some of these prophecies that we see through the writings of the prophets uh, and the Psalms and uh, the book of Revelation and uh, the prophecies that our Messiah himself laid out before us. And so once again, go back and take a look at those things and know and understand what the book of Daniel was all about. Very important to do that. Uh, we will again uh, be joining you in that study here very soon uh, concerning uh, our new program, uh, The Truth of Prophecy, that is also uh, in the wings. So with that, everybody, I just want to say once again, thank you so very, very much. And before we let you go uh, for this Fourth of July weekend and for our to enjoy the rest of our Father's Seventh-day Sabbath, uh, I'd like to just say a quick prayer over us all. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father. Blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all names. We love you so very, very much, Father. And we give you thanks for all that you do, Father, and all that you are. We give you thanks for everything, Father, that you do. And all of these things, Father, that you have given to us through the Scripture. We praise you, Father, and we ask, Father, that, again, you would continue to be with us throughout these days. Continue to be with us throughout these difficult times that we are now living in. We thank you for what you have left us through the prophet Daniel, these books that you told Daniel to close up until our time, our age, so that we could see them. We thank you, Father, for this compass that you've given us, this navigation system to help us to know and to understand not only what has happened in the past, but more about what might happen in the future and when. Thank you for giving us this timeline. Thank you for giving us this, this way to navigate through the evil days that we now live in. Thank you for giving us your armor to wear. Thank you for being our shield and our buckler. Thank you for the promise of the resurrection. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we ask, Father, that once again that you would Bless us and be with us, that you would keep your people. We pray, Father, that you would continue to pour out your Spirit upon us. And in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we praise your holy name, high and far above all, all names. With that, everybody, I just want to say thank you so very, very much for joining with us uh, for this particular study uh, concerning the abomination of desolation. I hope that we've given you some things to think about, some things to take to your prayer closet and uh, some things that you can concentrate on uh, over this weekend uh, and uh, until the next uh, study. We've got a lot more concerning uh, this abomination of desolation and, and some of the other things that we hear our Messiah talking to us about in the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew. So be sure to join us next Seventh-day Sabbath at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until then, uh, I believe that Pastor Jackie and Sister Two Feathers will be back for their uh, Ask, Seek, and Knock program Monday evening. Uh, we will be back again Wednesday as we are continuing to move through the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, until then, my friends, uh, we will see you uh, at Fellowship. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.